from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Today, it's a really exciting time for Mars researchers. The MAVEN mission to Mars was launched last November, and the spacecraft is due to arrive in the atmosphere, or dip into the atmosphere on September 21st. Is that still, that's still the plan? MAVEN, if you don't know, stands for Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution, with a capital N at the end. So this is one of the MAVEN members, our speaker. It's not going to land on the planet like the other spacecraft have, but it's just going to go into the atmosphere and it's going to go into an elliptical orbit and sample the solar wind. And with that probe, the scientists hope to learn more about the changes in the atmosphere over time that left the planet cold and dry. They have found in other missions ancient gullies and canyons that look as if they were carved by water and minerals that can only be made in standing water. So that's evidence that there once was liquid water on the planet. And they assume that the atmosphere had to have been much thicker and possibly warmer to support that water. We are really lucky today to have the co-investigator of the MAVEN team here today. I'm sure he's really busy and excited about what's going on. This is Jared Espley, who is a space scientist at Goddard's Planetary Magnetospheres Laboratory. And he was he was the, the person behind the magnetometer instrument, which is on board the MAVEN, so he's doubly excited. Dr. Espley is a Virginian, and his parents still live in southwest Virginia, and they are both librarians, so <laughs> yay. <laughs> um, he majored in atmospheric physics at the University of Virginia, and then received his PhD in physics from Rice University in Houston. And his wife, Claudia Nez, is here today, sitting next to him. She's also a scientist, and they met as physics students in, at UVA. We found their pictures when they were students. And then they both got their PhDs in Texas. She was in Austin and he in Houston. So um, they do have a child, a little girl, 15 months, who is probably going to be very different from her schoolmates in that when they're in the dinosaur phase, she'll be talking about the dinosaurs who lived on Mars. <laughs> And for those of us who grew up watching the TV show My Favorite Martian, today we may finally get some clues as to what happened to the other Martians. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Espley to talk about MAVEN. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, it is a real uh, uh, pleasure, honor to be here, like you said, uh, in particular, especially because my parents are, in fact, uh, librarians, uh, and so I think my dad had been here several times for professional reasons, and so it's, it's kind of neat to be here uh, for a separate reason, uh, to be here to share a little bit about the work that I've been doing. Um, so uh, I'm here to tell you about a scientific mystery. Uh, the scientific mystery I'd like to tell you about is uh, catastrophic climate change at Mars and what happened to the Martian atmosphere. So first thing we need to do is we need to establish the scene of the crime. So um, what I'd like to tell you first is that we know from some of the uh, orbiting satellites that we have at Mars already that Mars used to be a warm and wet environment. We can see... Uh, <coughs> There we go. Okay. Uh, we can see uh, from, from satellite that there are lots of uh, terrains on Mars that have dry riverbeds on them, uh, clearly uh, sinuous channels that have been cut by flowing water. And so it's, it's clear uh, the geologists uh, are, are quite certain that this is the only uh, could have been cut by flowing uh, liquid water on the surface of the planet. But yet now it's an ancient terrain. Likewise, uh, both from orbiting spacecraft, uh, but also from the rovers, there's two active rovers on the planet at the moment, as you probably know. Uh, we, so from both those lines of evidence, we know that there are, in fact, minerals on the surface of the planet that can only exist in the presence, could only have been formed in the presence of liquid water. So uh, perhaps billions of years ago, there would have been uh, standing liquid water on the surface that would have eventually uh, created these little concatenations that the rover team were calling blueberries or these little spherules of minerals that are only formed in the presence of liquid water. 
And then there's stratigraphy, which is just the geologist term for these layers of, of uh, sediment that have been laid down onto the surface of the planet. And you can see that they basically are dry uh, lake beds that have been laid, uh, laid up over time. And then there's types of minerals, again, that you can see from orbit as well. Okay, so that, that briefly lays out the ancient Mars, the fact that it had to be at least a wet uh, environment and correspondingly a warm environment. So turning now briefly to modern Mars, we know uh, that we can see some uh, ice, water ice, and also CO2 ice because it's so cold uh, on the poles at Mars. Uh, there is a lander that landed in, at the North Pole of Mars called the Phoenix Mission, and it also uh, discovered uh, some buried water ice uh, just under the dirt there. And in fact, there's this neat little thing that you probably can't even really see. Uh, there's these little specks that showed up on the landing uh, gear of the of the lander, and they think that might have been sublimated water that then condensed back up onto the uh, onto the gears uh, or onto the landing uh, struts there. Um, but so there so there is some water ice at Mars is what I'm trying to tell you modernly. And then this is an image from the Curiosity rover, which is in Gale Crater. That's the large rover that landed just a few years ago um, to great uh, acclaim. Uh, and what this image shows is they dug up a little dirt from the bottom of the crater there, and they uh, then analyzed what was in that dirt, and they found that there was a little small percentage of ice embedded in that dirt. But it's still pretty dry dirt there in the bottom of, of the crater of Gale Crater. So what uh, in summary I would say then is that modern Mars is mostly dry and, and very cold. Uh, typical temperatures at the equator, we're not even talking about the poles, uh, range from about uh, minus 130 to about uh, minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, there are very few rare places on Mars that every once in a while in the middle of the summer on the hottest day at the equator in the bottom of a low valley, you might get above freezing. Um, the atmosphere itself is super thin, comparatively speaking, compared to the terrestrial atmosphere. It's about 1 one hundredth as thick as the terrestrial atmosphere. Uh, and it's, it consists almost entirely of carbon dioxide, unlike our atmosphere, which of course has plenty of oxygen in it from all the plants that are producing the oxygen. Okay, so uh, in summary, what I want to tell you then is what this video will show you is that basically we have this idea that Mars used to be a warm, wet environment. In fact, perhaps even a habitable environment, a place where life could have potentially flourished early on in its history. But then something catastrophic happened. Something happened to change the environment in an extremely drastic way. Uh, and it eventually became the cold, uh, desolate desert that we see today. And so the question that we'd like to try and address with this mystery, the case of the missing Martian atmosphere, is how did we get from the warm, wet, habitable environment to the cold, dry environment that we have today? Okay, so uh, now I have to give you a physics lesson. This is the first of several physics lessons I'm going to give you. Hopefully I won't uh, put everybody to sleep. Um, the basic physics lesson, this one I imagine many of you have heard before, um, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page before I go any further, which is basically the idea of an atmospheric greenhouse. The idea is simply that uh, light, electromagnetic radiation, is uh, transparent to different media. So, for example, glass is transparent to visual light, and so you can see through glass. Um, the walls in this room, however, are not transparent to visual light, and hence we can't see into the other rooms next to us. However, this room apparently is mostly transparent to radio waves, and hence you can almost get a cell signal in this room. Uh, and so the, the basic idea then is that electromagnetic radiation can go through different media depending on, it, on its nature of the, of the radiation. And what happens in an atmosphere, in a planetary atmosphere, is the visual light, the optical light from the sun, goes through the atmosphere, reaches the ground, is absorbed into the material on the ground, and then is re-emitted in the infrared. And the infrared is not able to then go back out through the atmosphere, and so that energy is trapped. So that's the greenhouse effect. And the reason that's important is because the basic idea, one of the uh, first steps to solving this mystery, is the idea that in order to have had this warm, wet environment, you pretty much necessarily had to have a thick atmosphere, an atmosphere thick enough and warm enough in order to produce a greenhouse effect that could keep liquid water on the surface of the planet. Okay, so now we have a slightly better scenario uh, that we can talk about, which is that we have an ancient wet Mars with a thick atmosphere, and then we uh, today we have a modern dry Mars with a, a thin, dry atmosphere. And so how did we go from, from that state? 
Okay, physics lesson number two. So I gotta tell you what a plasma is. A plasma is basically very hot gas is the simplest way to put it. It's hot enough, the gas is hot enough that basically the individual atoms that are inside the gas become charged up. They become ions and electrons and that's because it's so hot and so they separate. Um, and so when uh, a plasma, when something is charged, then you have, uh, it's susceptible to electrical and magnetic field. That's why you get electricity because the electrons flow back and forth in, in your electrical outlet. Um, same thing for a plasma. The individual gas particles that are now ionized are susceptible and move in accordance to electrical and magnetic fields. Okay, so that's a plasma. Um, and sometimes people call it the fourth state of matter, um, just because you have, you know, your, your classic ones that we all know, solid, liquid, and gas, and then plasma. Almost none of us have any practical real world experience with uh, plasmas. I mean, I guess technically neon lights uh, have plasma in them, um, but otherwise pretty much there's no real plasma that we routinely interact with on Earth. But actually most of the universe is in fact made up of mostly plasma out in the, in the cosmos where things are, are quite hot and quite uh, diffuse. Um, okay, so having tell, told you about uh, plasma, physics lesson number three is I'm going to tell you about the solar wind. So the solar wind is a plasma. That's why I had to tell you what a plasma was first. Um, and uh, the solar wind is produced in the outer portions of the, of the sun, and it basically is a plasma that's streaming out into the interplanetary space. So it fills the entire solar system. This gas, this plasma is flowing out. Uh, it consists mostly of hydrogen ions, so hydrogen basically is just a proton when it's ionized, and also a little bit of helium, which comes exclusively from the sun, almost exclusively from the sun. And the speeds are kind of uh, beyond the, you know, human uh, normal everyday interactions, 400 kilometers a second, uh, well beyond anything we would normally interact with. And the other portion, the interesting port, uh, aspect of the solar wind is the, the densities. It's about five particles per cubic centimeter. There are trillions and trillions and trillions of particles in the, in the air in this room per cubic centimeter. So a little tiny cubic centimeter has trillions of gas uh, particles in it. Out there in space where the solar wind is, it's literally five, not five trillion, it's five. You can literally count them. So this is a much better vacuum than anything we could possibly make in the best laboratory on Earth. This is like the, the people who make semiconductors and need to have super precise machining equipment would be overwhelmed to have such an amazing vacuum as we have out there in space. So you might think to yourself, well, what you're basically saying, Jared, it is literally nothing in space, which is what people always talk about, the vacuum of space. But it's important enough uh, it has aspects and, and implications that it we'll see are very important, even though it's uh, almost literally nothing. The solar wind occasionally flare is uh, greatly increased when the, the sun flares up and creates solar flares or coronal mass ejections. You've seen these beautiful images uh, before. Basically, that's what happens when the sun gets very active and it greatly increases the solar wind temporarily. It makes a solar storm. Okay, physics lesson. I've lost track. Another physics lesson. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, to make a magnetic field, how do you make a magnetic field? You have to have material that is electrically conducting and you have to have motion. Uh, and so if you have both those things, then you can create magnetic fields. Um, and in this, uh, talking about in planetary context, the way you create a global planetary magnetic field is you have uh, electrically susceptible material in the interior of a planet, i.e. liquid iron. So it's swirling around inside our core and it is electrically susceptible and it's moving. So it creates a global planetary magnetic field. We know this is true because we point our compasses and we have done so for hundreds of years and they point north. Uh, and that's because there's a strong planetary magnetic field that's pointing north at, on our planet. Okay, put the solar wind, which is a plasma, together with a ma planetary magnetic field and you make what is called a magnetosphere. The magnetosphere simply just means that it's the area of space that is controlled by a magnetic field, a sphere, um, an area. Um, and in practice, what that means is that the, uh, the charged particles, the solar wind plasma that's streaming out of the sun that I told you about, coming out, interacts with the magnetic field of a planet like the Earth that has a planetary magnetic field and creates this magnetosphere. And the solar wind is mostly diverted around the planet. The magnetic field acts like a shield, interplanetary shield for the entire planet. Um, and that's again because the plasma that makes up the solar wind is susceptible to the magnetic fields to follow the trajectories that you're forced to follow 
when you're a charged particle. You have to obey the laws of motion of the electrical and magnetic fields. Okay. So I just told you what a magnetosphere is, and now I'm about to tell you, don't worry about that, because Mars doesn't have one. <laughs> uh, but you'll see why in a second, why I, I uh, went that way. So basically, we found out in the late 90s that Mars does not have a global planetary magnetic field like I just described Earth does. What it, we found out instead is when Mars Global Surveyor went around the planet with a magnetometer, an instrument to measure the magnetic field, it went into uh, orbit and it found no planetary magnetic field at all, pretty much it was extremely uh, negligible amounts of signal. I said every once in a while it would fly by a little piece of the crust and they would see a comparatively strong signal just over that piece of the crust at Mars. So you look at, you take all these observations over many months and eventually you're able to construct a map of where the strongest crustal fields are. Again, it's not a planetary size field, it's just very localized and you make a map of that. And so what we think is that there are little tiny leftover uh, crustal fields on the surface of the planet. There are no planetary magnetic fields. So what does that mean? Um, let me see if I can pause this. Okay. Um, so uh, here is our hypothesis then. Um, solar wind would be streaming through the solar system um, as the beginning of the animation shows. And you would eventually, uh, the solar wind would reach Mars. And it, at Mars, it would discover in the ancient days that Mars, in fact, had a global planetary magnetic field. Uh, and in fact, had a global magnetosphere. And the reason for that, we think then in the ancient days that Mars, in fact, had a liquid iron core, just like the Earth still does today. That core was swirling around and created the planetary magnetic field. And so you had a Martian magnetosphere in the early days. Something happened then. The course uh, no longer uh, produced a global planetary magnetic field. And at that point, then the solar wind was able to interact directly with the Martian atmosphere because the global magnetosphere of the planet went away. And so the solar wind was able to come stream in and interact directly with the Martian atmosphere and has gradually been eroding it one molecule at a time blowing it away into interplanetary space over billions of years. So that's our hypothesis of what happened to the solar wind or what happened to the Martian atmosphere. How are we going to test this hypothesis? The MAVEN mission. Uh, Stephanie mentioned its acronym already. It's the Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution Mission. Uh, and it was launched uh, just over uh, 10 months ago or about 10 months ago. Uh, this video is playing a little slowly, uh, but it launched on the 18th of November. Uh, and I'll pause right here and just say that most of the time when people ask me what my job's like, you know, I say it's, it's really neat. It's, a, it's an amazing opportunity to be paid to explore space. Um, but um, to be perfectly honest, I always then say the footnote that it's like most any other technical office job where I do presentations most times or I do some email uh, I have a telecon, uh, I have to write a little code for my technical work. Um, but really, honestly, there's nothing really amazingly magical uh, NASA-like uh, about it most of the time. Except every once in a while, there are truly amazing moments. And, the, and that happens when something that you literally worked on with your own hands is going on a spacecraft into, Mar into space, into interplanetary space, to go to some other location forever. To, to make measurements uh, to help us understand how the universe is going to work. So when launches happen, uh, even if they go really slowly because the video uh, is struggling, um, uh, it is an amazing opportunity to kind of reassess all of our places uh, in the universe and, in the, and how we can contribute to understanding it. So um, once MAVEN uh, successfully launched, unlike, say, the video, uh, then it had a 10-month cruise uh, that it took. Uh, it was a 400 million mile cruise, uh, and that's because you can't go straight towards where Mars was when you launched. You have to try and catch up with the, with the planet. And so even though it's only a mere 40 million miles between Earth and Mars, you have to go on this long uh, trajectory and play catch up with the planet uh, on the way over. Okay, so if you were a little space gremlin following along with MAVEN on its way to Mars, what you would have seen for these past 10 months is pretty much nothing. You would have seen the, plan, the, the, um, the spacecraft on its way uh, flying through interplanetary space in this vacuum of the solar wind that I described before. 
every once in a while something might little move on the spacecraft a little thing would turn to the left and uh, maybe maybe it reorients just slightly a little light would blink on it or something your space gremlin would probably think that a spacecraft is either dead or in deep hibernation and they it, the gremlin would more or less be right it has been more or less in hibernation um but um in uh tomorrow my uh colleagues uh who work in the mission control We'll send, upload a command to the spacecraft to tell it that it's game time. It, the time has come, and uh, they will. And the countdown will, will start ticking on the spacecraft, totally autonomously at that point. Basically, the the human's job is done tomorrow when somebody hits that button, um, and the the countdown starts. And then uh, on Sunday night, this Sunday at about 10 o'clock Eastern time, the rocket engine will fire. And so this giant roar of rocket engine flames will come pouring out of the spacecraft. Your space gremlin will probably be rather startled at this point. Uh, and it's going to burn for 30 minutes. So there will be huge flames coming out in the, in the vacuum of space. And it will lose all of its momentum that it had uh, accumulated to get all the way there to Mars over 440 million miles. And at that point, uh, it'll basically be captured into uh, orbit by the gravity of the planet. And so it'll go into a very uh, elliptical orbit at first, uh, just to make sure that we get captured on Sunday. Um, very soon after this happens on Sunday night, we will know that it successfully worked. Um, and it'll go into this very elliptical orbit around the planet. Um, and then a few days and weeks later, actually on uh, Tuesday, they will turn, or Monday night, I think it is, they will turn on uh, the instrument I worked on the most, the magnetometer, and we'll start getting data. But then a few days later, they will lower the, uh, the orbit so that it's not quite so elliptical. It'll still be comparatively elliptical, as you can see from this animation. Um, and so we'll be passing very close to the planet at about 150 kilometers uh, at the closest approach. And then we'll go all the way back out to about 6,000 kilometers at, at the farthest uh, distance away. And I'll explain in a moment why it's important to have this uh, moderately elliptical orbit um, for our particular mission. OK, so what are we going to do when we actually get there? Well, so again, the solar wind's coming in at Mars. And the energetic particles of the solar wind are going to interact with the Martian atmosphere and create uh, ionized particles. And they are going to be subject to the magnetic fields that occur at Mars. And they will gyrate away from the planet. Um, but the, the question is, is if, as we are looking at these particles that are being produced by the solar wind coming in, which one of them are actually flying away and which ones of them are going back and re-impacting the planet? And which of the particles are the ones that are coming from the solar wind? We have three different types of particles we have to try and count and capture. We have to count the particles that are coming from the sun. We have to count the particles that are planetary but actually escaping. And we have to count the particles that are uh, planetary but not actually going to escape. Because as, as I told you, these are all mostly plasma. And they have to follow the trajectories that are given to them by the magnetic fields. And so we'll have to try and count up these particles and capture them. Uh, in our instruments that we have on board. So we have a suite of instruments specifically designed to do that. Um, we have instruments that are designed specifically to try and understand the solar inputs to the system, which are uh, these instruments up here, uh, whether it be the sun's uh, light or the solar energetic particles, the solar wind that come in. And then we also have instruments that are designed to try and understand and capture the escaping uh, ionized plasma particles from the planet, and also instruments that are able to capture neutral, non-ionized, non-charged particles that are escaping from the planet. And I won't bother telling you what all the acronyms mean, but these are the broad categories of the instruments that we have. Each one of these is like a little butterfly net um, that's able to more or less just capture the local particles that is literally let flying through this, uh, the area of the spacecraft at any given moment. And we'll count them up by mass, by how much energy, and by what type of particle they are. And we'll start making a tally. We'll have a, a information about what has happened in any given particular location at Mars at a given point in time. But then you might, uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about this carefully, okay, Jared, so you just said you're going to count the particles in orbit at any given time. But of course, what you're really interested in is the total atmospheric escape, because that was a whole mystery that we're going back to, right? We have a whole atmosphere that supposedly flew away. And if we want to know how did a whole atmosphere fly away? We need to try and count up all the particles that are escaping at the moment. Okay, 
Obviously, we can't make a planetary sized butterfly net and try and capture all those particles. So what we do is we're in orbit and we're going to take individual measurements at each space and time and then we'll add them up. Um, and so because of that elliptical orbit that I told you about where we go down both low in altitude and both far in altitude away from the planet, we're able to sample the region around Mars that is close to the planet and far to it from it. And we're also able to focus on trying capturing the particles um, in all different geometries with respect to the sun. So that elliptical orbit will process around the planet. Uh, in other words, uh, this little butterfly, uh, this net of observations uh, is basically, imagine the sun's on the right and streaming in. It will be our orbit as it goes and uh, processes around the planet. And so uh, at any given time, we'll only be capturing one set of individual particles uh, at any given space and time. But over the course of a year, an Earth year, we will have enough statistics to start trying to talk about how much is escaping globally across the planet because we can start making a global picture of the amount of escape that's happening. Okay, so just to uh, orient you where Mo uh, MAVEN is in terms of the Mars program overall, these are the active or future missions at the planet. Um, so uh, Mars Odyssey, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the Mars Express mission, which is a European mission, but the US has some contributions to, all in orbit around Mars currently. Uh, Opportunity is still uh, roving on the planet, as is Curiosity. Uh, Spirit, the other rover, sadly, is no longer functioning. Um, we will be getting there uh, on Sunday, like I said. Um, there's a Indian mission that's not on this chart uh, that's two days behind us. They get there on, I guess that makes it Tuesday. Uh, they launched with exactly the same opportunity. Remember how you saw that? 440 million uh, mile trajectory is basically opportunities once every couple of years to go to Mars. And so the Indians took advantage of the same opportunity that we did. And so they are arriving two days after we do. Um, and then there's two more uh, planned landers, a stationary lander that will have a, a seismometer to try and understand the geophysics of the surface of the planet, and then another rover in 2020. Um, and I tell you all this because uh, I'm basically at the more or less at the end of my usual talk. And so you're about to get a bonus uh, talk <laughs> because we on the mission got a, an amazing bonus as well. Um, what we found out about uh, a year and a half ago was that there's this comet called Comet Sighting Spring. Uh, it was discovered with a very modest, it's a professional observatory, but a very modest telescope, a half meter telescope. That's a picture of it there. Um, by Robert McNaught, uh, and uh, actually I was just reading on Wikipedia, which I know is a little dangerous, uh, that the telescope uh, used to be in Sweden and basically was retired and then made all its way down to this observatory in Australia. So it's had a second life and it's made a pretty amazing discovery uh, along with its uh, uh, owner or manipulator, Robert. Uh, and so the telescope discovered that, uh, that there's a comet is a comet coming from the outer reaches of the solar system. They call that the Oort cloud. Uh, it's trillions and trillions of miles away from the inner solar system where we are now, dark outer reaches of the solar system. As best we know, this comet has never ever come into the solar system before. It's its first time in. Something out there nudged it. Presumably something else flew by, gave it a little gravity boost, and it came flying in millions of years ago because it would have taken a long time to get here. Um, but it's never been here before. It's on its way. Robert looked in his telescope and he saw the trajectory and it was headed literally straight at Mars. Um, and so um, that was a pretty exciting discovery to find that this comet was literally heading straight towards Mars about a year and a half ago. So before I go any further, I would like to give you a little anatomy lesson. Uh, we had a physics lesson before, now it's anatomy, uh, cometary anatomy. So comets uh, are basically chunks of uh, ice and dirt left over from the beginnings of the solar system. So when the planets all coalesced together to form the planets of the solar system, the sun became a, a fusion engine of energy. There are little chunks of ice and sand or dirt or dust, whatever you want to call it, that were left. And these are, these are what comets are. And their size of the actual comet itself, we call it the nucleus, is between one and 10 kilometers. So you know, planetary scale, super tiny. These are very tiny objects. Okay, so you have this, this central uh, dirty snowball, as they call it, that's the nucleus. And then around that, as a comet approaches the, the sun, it starts heating up. 
And as it starts to heat up, then the ice uh, starts to sublimate or melt. And uh, the ice starts pouring off in the form of vapor as, and water, pours off of the, of the comet. Uh, a little bit of the dirt gets kicked up along with this ice that's sublimating away. And pretty soon, you've got this gigantic cloud of gas around the comet. And they call that the coma. Uh, and so the coma is this cloud. And it consists mostly of water uh, atoms that are or water molecules that are coming off the, of the comet. Some of those eventually end up getting ionized and become a plasma, like we talked about before. And again, there's also some of this dust that's coming off as well. So you end up with two tails for the comet, uh, a dust tail and a plasma tail. And then you have this coma of gas around it. Comas are pretty huge. So if you've got one to 10 kilometer sized chunk of the central dirty snowball, then the coma is hundreds of thousands of kilometers because it spreads out and it makes this giant cloud. And there's no hard boundary to the coma. It just kind of trails off to nothing back out to the densities of the solar wind eventually. But the, the number people kind of throw around just to have a round number is 100,000 kilometers is the size of a coma. Um, Okay, so how close is, uh, is Comet Sinai Spring coming to Mars? That's the coma coming at you, that red or the blue thing. Uh, there's some dust particles with it. This is a simulation, obviously, and there we go. The comet just went by with the coma of about 100,000 kilometers. Uh, the actual distance is about 134,000 kilometers uh, is how far away the nucleus will miss the planet. That's about a third of the way to the moon the Earth's moon. Uh, so if this comet were to come to uh, Earth, it would go zipping by in between the moon and Earth. Um, since I just told you that comas don't have a hard boundary, what this effectively means is that Mars will be enveloped by the coma of the, of the comet. So the Mars will not be hit by the cometary nucleus, but the coma will encircle the planet and the gas that is in that uh, comet will interact with Mars. Okay, so the question really on a, a lot of our minds at the moment is how actually active the comet is, because that round number of 100,000 kilometers for the coma depends greatly on how uh, intense or how active the comet is. And by activity, we just mean how much water is flowing out from the comet at any given time. Because they usually say that comets are a bit like cats. They have tails, and they do exactly what they want to do. So there's no predicting what a comet's going to do. You guys might have heard about Comet Ison, which people were hoping would be a spectacular comet. It turned out to get burned up completely by the sun before it even got back to us at Earth. Um, so the question is, do we have a moderate comet? Do we have a low-activity comet? Do we have a, uh, a very intense high-activity comet? Which correspondingly tells us, is there a ton of gas a, a, a very uh, large amount of a, a huge coma, both in terms of density and in terms of size, or is it moderate? So at the moment, they're watching it very carefully, and they think that it's a moderately intense comet, um, which is um, both exciting and a little unnerving, because yeah, what's going to happen to all of our spacecraft, and selfishly, most importantly, what's going to happen to MAVEN? We're going to literally get there a month before this happens, uh, on Sunday again, uh, and the comet comes by a month later, and is that going to be a problem for us? So there was a lot of concern uh, early on, and they did a lot of very detailed modeling, specifically of the dust, because again, you have the dust, you have the plasma, and you have the gas. The gas and the plasma are not dangerous. Um, they're so diffuse, even though I just spent all this time emphasizing how much you could get. They're still nonetheless spread out, and it's at a molecular scale that are not dangerous to spacecraft. Dust, on the other hand, is definitely potentially dangerous. Dust, and by dust we mean something about the size of a millimeter, so something you can just barely see a speck of dust, like in your house. Um, but it's moving at 56 kilometers a second. A armor penetrating round from a tank shooting another tank trying to penetrate their, the armor of that other tank is about two kilometers a second. So a speck of dust the size of a millimeter going that fast would literally just blow a hole through anything that's on a spacecraft. I mean, literally just blow a hole. Um, so there's a lot of concern. People did very detailed modeling in conjunction with the very detailed observations that people are making of the comet, and it seems very likely that the dust will literally just miss Mars. So the coma will envelop the planet, the gas. The dust is literally by just tens of thousands of kilometers going to miss the planet and the spacecraft that are there. 
So that's reassuring. It is modeling, however. <laughs> and so we are taking some basic precautions with all the spacecraft. I don't know the details for the other missions. Uh, the ones on the ground are not in any danger. The atmosphere of Mars were totally protect, though, even though I'd spent a lot of time saying how thin it was. It's thick enough to prevent uh, the dust from doing anything besides making a meteor shower. Spacecraft in orbit, however, including MAVEN, we're going to take basic precautions. The one main thing that we're going to do is we know more or less exactly when the comet's going to be there to, to the minute. And we know when its dust tail is going to be there to within the minute. And we will therefore time our orbit. We'll get a little tiny extra kick of our engine to make sure that our orbit has us on the far side of the planet when the comet comes by. So the whole planet of Mars will be our shield to try and protect us from the comet. Um, secondly, we'll simply orient our spacecraft uh, so that our solar arrays are edge on to the direction of the incoming dust. Just minimize our cross section. It's not a huge effect because you still got the body of the spacecraft, but the solar arrays are the biggest target. And then the third thing is we'll turn off instruments on the uh, spacecraft, on MAVEN, that could be potentially damaged, not by a direct hit, because if you get hit by a direct hit, it, you, know, you literally just blew something up. But if, you, if something else on the spacecraft got hit, and then produced a gigantic cloud of debris, what will happen is it'll almost instantly get ionized in this environment, and then it'll all get sucked into our particle detectors. And again, remember, we're trying to measure five particles <laughs> per cubic centimeter, maybe, you know, 100. Okay, so it's a giant storm. Okay, 500. Okay, if you're talking like human scale, microscopic scale stuff, like a big plume of stuff, like trillions of stuff being sucked into our detectors, that's very bad. So they'll turn off all the high voltages on the particle detectors when the comet goes by. Magnetometer will be left on because we don't have any high voltages or anything. So if we don't get hit, then we'll just make measurements the entire time when the comet goes by. Which is super exciting because I think there's going to be fantastic science uh, to be the result of this. Basically, again, I spent this whole talk telling you that we're trying to understand atmospheric escape at Mars as the result of solar wind coming in and interacting with the Martian atmosphere. Well... What we have right now is we have a cometary uh, impact on the, on the planet, the gas and plasma coming in, and there's going to be two magnetospheres put together, the, the fake magnetosphere of Mars, the one that Mars doesn't really have, and the cometary magnetosphere, and they're going to come together, and not only that, you're going to get heating of the upper atmosphere as all this gas goes in and is absorbed in the upper atmosphere, because again, on the ground, it, it doesn't reach the ground. But the upper atmosphere, uh, best calculations at the moment that the upper atmosphere will have its temperature increase for a matter of hours uh, by about 30 degrees. Um, so that's a very significant impulse of energy into the upper Martian atmosphere, which very well may drive atmospheric escape temporarily, which is exactly what we're designed to do. So we were hoping to study the solar wind causing atmospheric escape at Mars. We we're hoping to study the uh, effects of solar storms uh, in uh, beyond solar wind causing atmospheric escape at Mars. But now we're going to have the opportunity to study atmospheric escape as caused by a comet uh, going by Mars. And in this case, instead of hydrogen in the solar wind, it'll be the water ions and the water molecules coming off the, the comet that'll cause the atmospheric escape. All the other missions are planning science as well. I know the rovers are trying, going to try and take images from the ground. Um, that would uh, be a, an amazing uh, image, I think, uh, because it'll be a beautiful image of a comet from the surface of another planet by our robots. Um, I can't promise that it's going to be a spectacular image from a uh, beauty point of view, perhaps. Uh, and that's because uh, now that uh, I've learned a little bit more about it, the rover's cameras are well designed to do exactly what they do, which is a look at rocks you know, 10 feet away, 50 feet away. They're not really great telescopes, um, nor are they even really great night sky cameras. Uh, I think they're gonna uh, probably get good images uh, and I'm really excited to see them. I just don't know if they will be uh, knock your socks off type of beauty, but the intrinsic uh, nature of those images of a comet uh, being taken from the surface of another planet is just an amazing idea to me. Uh, the other orbiting missions will also have the opportunity to get very close-up images of the comet as it goes by, and so we're looking forward to that as well. Okay, so in summary, what I wanted to tell you was about the mystery, the scientific mystery we have, that Mars used to be a warm, wet, habitable environment, potentially even literally with life, and then catastrophic climate change happened, and it went to a dry, cold, desolate environment that we see today. And our leading hypothesis of how that happened, how that catastrophic climate change occurred, 
is that Mars lost its early magnetosphere and the solar wind has been able to gradually strip away the Martian atmosphere one particle at a time over billions of years, blowing it away into interplanetary space. And then as I just was telling you, the comet is going to be an amazing, fantastic science opportunity and also just an amazing cosmic coincidence that we're all looking forward to. If you want to look uh, for more information about MAVEN, you can find it on the web. Uh, and if you really want to hear um, more stuff from me, you can follow me on Twitter. That's it. Thanks very much. More exciting than we ever expected. Um, we can have some questions now, and we'll ask Dr. Espley to repeat them so everybody can hear them. And so let's begin. Please, go ahead. Um, the comet, that's fascinating. What will be the duration of the past life? Minutes or? Because you're, you're on the other side of the planet, and it's, and it's moving. Yeah. So, so yeah, so uh, uh, the, again, the nucleus, it's, uh, so the question was, is how long will the cometary passage actually take uh, at Mars? Um, there's several answers to that, like there always are in science. Um, the, the short answer is that if we think of the comet as its coma, um, then it will take a matter of hours for this 100,000 kilometer uh, sized coma to pass by the near Mars space. So it'll just be a matter of hours that, that, um, that it'll be passing by. Our orbit, uh, our orbiter will be, uh, it has a five, four and a half hour orbit uh, on MAVEN. So the only time we will be truly protected from the comet is during that time when the dust tail passes by. And the dust tail is a much more narrow uh, constraint than the coma. Uh, so so the, the danger time is a matter of 30 minutes or so, and we will be comparatively well protected by the planet for those 30 minutes. Yep, uh, in the back, and then I'll get to the front. Um, you mentioned that, the, that there would be two interacting magnetospheres, and I guess um, I was really interested by the idea of the magnetosphere of a comet. Do we know much about the, you know, what's sort of theorized and what's sort of known about the magnetospheres of comets? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, what do we know about uh, the magnetospheres of comets, since I mentioned there's going to be two interacting magnetospheres temporarily at, at Mars? Um, in some ways, uh, I mean, obviously, the Earth's magnetosphere is the most well-studied and understood magnetosphere in the, in the solar system. Uh, the Jupiter has a very powerful and strong magnetic field as well, and so it produces a huge magnetic field and magnetosphere. However, comets, in many ways, are uh, the prototypical other magnetosphere. People have been studying them for decades with the, some of the spacecraft in the 80s that were exploring Halley's Comet and, and uh, so many of the other comets that they did flybys of. Um, in many ways, a comet is exactly like the Martian-induced uh, magnetosphere, the fake magnetosphere uh, that Mars doesn't really have. Uh, basically, temporarily, uh, when the coma expands from the, uh, from the nucleus and creates this neutral gas cloud and becomes ionized, then the ionized gas interacts with the solar wind and creates this uh, extended magnetosphere, much larger than you would expect from a kilometer-sized object. Um, and so it's... Um, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting uh, subject in its own right. So the moving charged particles that are created by this are actually in the coma rather than in the nucleus. Yes. So the uh, the charged particles that uh, create the the magneto the cometary magnetosphere are in fact out in the coma. The only thing that's in the nucleus is the actual dirty snowball, the actual chunk of ice and dirt. So a uh, question in the front, and then we'll keep going around the room. Um, this probably be a very long answer potentially, but maybe you should think succinctly. But, um, why did the uh, Mars core stop producing a magnetic field for this cool, this kind of cool down? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, he, uh, the question is, is uh, why did the Martian mag uh, core stop creating a planetary magnetic field? Uh, and he was worried that the scientist would give the long, complicated answer. <laughs> and, and I will, I, I, and I, and I will do my best to avoid that. Uh, it froze. Uh, is the is the is the short answer. Uh, I, I turn on my scientist hat and give all the caveats and footnotes, but uh, that's the short answer is we think that there just wasn't enough heat uh, in the core to keep it uh, liquid for billions of years, unlike our core. Yep. Question in the back and then over on the side. Go ahead. Yeah, so the question is, do any of the other measurements that have been taken at Mars give an estimate as to what time the um, planetary magnetic field would have ceased? 
Yes. Uh, they, uh, the easiest way to do that is to look to see where these little patches of crustal magnetic field are located at. And you can see that where these patches of crustal magnetic field are only in the ancient parts of, of Mars. So if something else came by and hit the surface, either an impact or a big volcano, then there's no magnetic field any longer. So what we think what that means is there was a planetary sized magnetic field. It created the global magnetosphere. The core shut down because it froze. The magnetic field shut down. And any rocks that had any iron in them kept a little tiny magnetic remnant uh, in them. And if nothing's happened for billions of years since, they still have that little tiny remnant of magnetic field that was in, in them billions of years ago. But if something else happened, smashed the rock, melted it, boom, the crustal magnetic field is lost. And so that's how we are to able to estimate approximately that the Martian uh, magnetic field probably stopped uh, about 3.5 billion years ago. Okay, question over there. So the first question is what, uh, what's the science objective or what's the objective, I should be broader, uh, of the Indian mission. Uh, the Indian mission is called uh, Mars Orbiter Mission. Its acronym is MOM. Um, so you have an Indian mom going to Mars. Uh, the, uh, the overall objective of that mission is uh, primarily technical. And what I mean by that, you think, you're thinking to yourself, well, I think, isn't science all technical? What I mean by that is an engineering demonstration. So they want to prove that they can get uh, an interplanetary mission uh, working. However, they are uh, very happy to accommodate the science instruments that they have on board. They have a diverse set of science instruments on board. They have a camera, um, they have a couple of spectrometers. Um, I don't remember anything else off the top of my head. Um, so they, uh, their, their science goals are fairly broad, um, unlike this focus mission that we have with MAVEN. Um, the second question you asked was, oh yes, the press. So the question was, when, uh, when might uh, the public expect for results from Maven to start coming in and there might be press releases and how would one find such things? Um, so certainly after the Mars orbit insertion, uh, uh, I'll be watching NASA TV with everybody else who's interested and we will know through NASA TV whether it all successfully works on Sunday. Um, then in the, in the days coming, I imagine there will be uh, press releases. I think there's going to be a press release really late at night on Sunday night, just saying, yay, it worked. Um, but then there will be press releases saying that we have successfully started our transition and start getting our data. There won't be any science content per se to those, because unlike, say, the rovers, where immediately you can start getting imagery and you can say, hey, cool, look at this rock that we found. Our mission, again, is designed to be uh, statistical in nature almost, you might say, to, in order to get our... Uh, butterfly net of capturing the particles will take some months. We anticipate our first science results, therefore, to be coming out about three months uh, after the uh, start of science in November. Um, we, we have a six-week commissioning phase before science fully starts. So, um, so about three months will be the early results, and then in the coming uh, months and, and years, of course. Um, how you get that information, I'd say the best way is just go to the website. Um, you know, there are press releases that come out. Um, I mean, certainly they'll be at the website, at the Maven website at NASA. Uh, or if you've used Twitter, then you can follow them on Twitter. Yep. Question for Dr. Huerta. Um, yeah, so I was trying to think about the impact of the necessity for a magnetic field on uh, an atmosphere stay and a sort of life stay. So, like, <coughs> hypothetically, like, do we think because if, if the solar wind, if without a magnetic field, the solar wind is blowing away atmospheres on Mars, So uh, the question was, uh, what happens uh, to other planets if they, they were to lose their magnetic fields, uh, for example, Earth, or for just any hypothetical uh, planet, uh, if it's a, a prerequisite to create life? Do you need to have a, a global planetary magnetic field to have the conditions to create life? So the first uh, part of the question, I would say, uh, yes, if a planet loses its global planetary magnetic field, then the solar wind interacts directly with it, and eventually, 
if our understanding of how the physics work and our hypothesis bears out with MAVEN, then yes, it would lose its atmosphere. However, at Mars, it took literally billions of years for this to happen. So um, this is not something any of us need to worry about happening at Earth um, in, in our lifetimes uh, by any stretch. Um, but it is, so, it is something that we think happened at other planets. And it, it kind of points to the, the whole reason to do planetary science in the first place, which is comparative planetology, comparing one planet to the other and trying to understand how planets work uh, overall. Um, the other part of your question is whether it's a prerequisite to life uh, for a planet to have a global planetary magnetic field. Uh, that depends on the origins of life, how long it takes to get going, uh, how long you need to be protected, uh, how long you need to have a thick atmosphere, the details of uh, how your starting conditions, how thick your atmosphere was to begin with. So I don't think it's strictly speaking a prerequisite to have a planetary magnetic field. You certainly need to be protected and have a hospitable environment to start that life process. Okay, question over here. Oh, oh, that, 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 that. Uh, she went first, and then we'll get you, Stephanie. Okay. okay. I'm trying to re remember back to when um, you were talking about habitable zones and stuff. Was Mars ever in the habitable zone where there could be life? Like, I can't quite remember. Yeah, so people, one. yeah, so the question is, was Mars ever in, in what's uh, commonly called the habitable zone, which is the uh, which is the zone, uh, it's typically defined as the area where liquid water would easily uh, exist on the surface of a, of a planetary body relative to the star that it's orbiting. So in other words, at a certain distance, it's way too hot and the bo water will boil away. And at a certain distance, you're guaranteed to freeze out the water. Um, so the answer is yes, because the habitable zone's a little uh, stretchy because of what, what I was just saying. It depends on exact conditions of the planet. So clearly we know um, pretty much with no doubt that Mars used to have liquid water on its surface for a long time. There are, for the, you don't carve giant canyons you know, just with a little rainstorm. It takes a lot of water to do that and to make the mineral. So yes, the short answer is it had to be habitable uh, zone. It had to have liquid water on it and therefore in the habitable zone. Uh, so, well, by definition, uh, so the definition of the habitable zone is a little stretchy, like I say, because uh, it, it doesn't have liquid water on the surface now, uh, not at least not in substantial quantities. We see tiny little gullies that maybe have a little liquid water. So the habitable zone changed uh, uh, only by definition, really. I mean, it didn't, Mars didn't move any farther from the sun, obviously. It's, it's the climate change that changed. Stephanie, and then uh, and one more question potentially. We probably will have to wrap things up soon. But. Mine's kind of silly, but you, they keep talking about colonizing Mars, and it sounds like things are only going to get worse on Mars. Why would we want to colonize 130 below? <laughs> so Stephanie's question is, why would we want to colonize Mars? Um, I don't think I'm, uh, as a scientist, qualified to uh, to speak about you know the the political reasons or the personal reasons why a person would choose to colonize Mars. I will say that. Uh, this type of climate change that I'm describing today, um, it takes the, the billions of years. This is, you know, beyond geological time scales. It's, yeah. So it's not, uh, Mars is not getting any worse in the short term, that's for sure. So uh, the decision about to send humans to Mars as explorers and or eventually as colonists uh, is, a, is a question that we as a society will have to decide what's important and worth to us. Um, um, and so, you know, we can talk about it, uh, at lunch, uh, okay. you know, why, why uh, uh, somebody might go to Mars to start a colony there. Would That's you it. want to go there? Uh, I personally would not. Uh, 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 and the short answer to that is because it takes 10 months to get there. <laughs> and then it's 10 months back. And uh, however long you want to stay there. Uh, and uh, to get there, you'd have to be in a little school bus size spacecraft at best. Um, I don't. I know enough about myself that I get stir crazy in my house after about a day. Uh, uh, my wife's over there rolling her eyes, uh, and uh, so that would be uh, uh, something that I don't think it would it would be worth it to me. I mean, it certainly as a five year old, I would have absolutely, or a ten year old, or even twelve year old, absolutely. Of course, I want to go to Mars. Uh, knowing myself as an adult, it just would not be a pleasant enough experience. Um, I'd miss my daughter and my wife as well if I was gone for three years. Yeah. So uh, should, do we have time for one more or should we wrap it up? Or Okay, you had your hand up then. Well, anybody else have a question? It could be kind of a long question. Okay, so I was just going to ask, so what is, what is the, what's the realm of like uh, of hypotheses or, or uh, uh, parameters that, that, that you're sort of studying about this erosion process of the atmosphere 
I'm, it sounds like the, the big question is, did, does, does, does that process work? If you don't have a magnetic field, does the, does the atmosphere uh, evaporate? But you know, are, there, are there sort of theoretical things that are not known about the rate of evaporation or, or other, you know, what are the physics are you probing? With? Yeah. I suspect there are a couple of layers. There are uh, many layers. So the simple answer, again, is butterfly net capturing the particles, counting them all up. Okay, well, how are you going to do that? Uh, okay, so we capture it on this particular time, and then the, uh, another part of the orbit, we cap this other part. But are the conditions exactly the same? Was the solar wind exactly the same as it was, you know, between time A and time B? Were the conditions during time A and time B over our one Earth year the same as they have been for billions of years? We need to know how so the solar wind of a star, an Earth-like star, evolves over time. Uh, so that we can try and extrapolate back in time and figure out, based on how many particles we see being lost today, how many particles would have been lost over 3.5 billion years. So those are all, exactly like you said, wrapped into theoretical models and observations of other stars as well. Are we finished? I know you had something you wanted to well, ask. Uh, how long do you hope or estimate that the collection will take, will, will continue? So, uh, so the question was, to how long will our collection of the data take place? Our nominal mission is one Earth year. That's not on the basis of hardware or, or anything. Uh, that's just how long we thought we needed to get our, our minimum statistics to be able to start uh, legitimately answering this question. Um, there's no reason the hardware would fail for many, many years. We have enough rocket fuel on board to maintain our orbit, our elliptical orbit, for many, many years. Uh, so at that point, it becomes a programmatic question for NASA headquarters to decide if it's worth maintaining the mission, and we certainly would uh, hope so. Well, thank you so much, Jared Espley. That was great. <laughs>